My name is Conrad Steiner. I'm a doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, Mercy Wears an Apron. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. To the profession of medicine, to the men and women who labor in its cause, this story is dedicated. Our presentation tonight, the field of public health nursing. The object in point, a faded movie still. The case in point, John Peter Walkowski. He's known to the world as Bert Cromwell. Age, not revealed. Not too long ago, his gleaming smile and heroic adventures flashed across the screens of a thousand movie theaters. Women adored him. Men admired him. Every luxury the world provides was his. But an animal and a few ounces of metal changed the entire course of his existence. Hello. I said hello. What do you want? I'm Miss Burns, the public health nurse. Get out. <coughs> you hear me? I said get out. I heard you the first time, Mr. Cromwell. How'd you know my name? For an actor, you're very modest, Mr. Cromwell. You're talking to a girl who sat through under the big top twice just to see you and Spangles flying through the air. Who sent you here? I was in the neighborhood. I heard you needed some help. I don't need your help. Bath, clean sheets. Will that destroy your almighty independence? Look, if I want a bath, I can manage without your help. Go on, get back to your bedpan and leave me alone. Did you hear me? I said get out. Hi, Pat. You Miss Burns? Yes. Gee, I'm sorry I'm late. I got stuck at the studio. They didn't kill me till a quarter after five. Would you believe it, Bert? 500 people on the set, and all Bennett has to do is yell Indians. And for three grand a week, he muffs it. Twelve takes. Didn't go for it, huh? No. Wait just a minute, will you? So I double-crossed you, huh? You saw it. 
I don't want anybody around here. Will you get it through your head? I don't need anybody. You've laid in this bed for months now, Bert. Got sores all over you. You're dirty. Got to change the bed every day. Sometimes twice a day. You know that. The way your legs are, you can't do a thing. Shut up about my legs. How long have we got to shut up about it, Bert? How long can we live like this? I'm not a nurse. I've got to know what to do. All right, all right. This isn't so bad here. It was a lot worse in the coal mines. We were kids and everything was easy. You're still a kid. Yeah, sure, sure. Miss Burns would be very grateful if you could help us. I'd be glad to do anything I can. First thing, I'd like to clean up things a bit around here and make things more comfortable for him. After that, I'd like to call his doctor before we do anything else. Okay, I'll get his number for you. Is there anything else? Where's the nearest water? It's right down the hall, just on the right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, then the money ran out and Monica left him. She clipped him for everything, even the house. She lets us live here so our flat can tell the world what a big heart she has. But I guarantee when she gets back, out we go. Doesn't he ever get out of that bed? He's got everything. Wheelchair, crutches, braces. He just won't touch them. When he was in the hospital, didn't anybody ever try to teach him? They tried. He just wouldn't learn. He wouldn't even listen to the doctor, and he went to AWOL from the hospital. He should be doing exercises, too. His whole body will waste away if he just lies there in bed. You think he's in the mood to learn now? I think maybe so. I think he knows that if he don't get out of that bed soon, he's never going to get out. I'll talk to his doctor before my next visit. Even with the paralysis, there are things he can learn to do for himself. Yeah. Oh, I just hate to see him lying there day after day like this. I've known him since I was a kid. My family brought me over from England when I was 12 years old. We lived together, Bert and me. He was a bull. We were just a couple of kids sweating it out in the coal mines near Pittsburgh. We didn't mind. We were having a ball. Still, one day Bert disappeared and I thought, well, that's the end of Bert. A few years later, I get a letter. Come to Hollywood. And we've been together ever since. Stood in for him, double for him, whenever they didn't want to risk his face. Is that you and under the big top and spangles on the high trapeze? In the long shots, yeah. But Bert did the close-ups. Didn't tell me what happened. How'd he get hurt? I shot him. You shot him? We are making tornado at the time. I can't remember what happened, but Bert got fed up. Anyway, he hired a plane, and the two of us went off to Black River to do some hunting. When a mountain lion cornered, Bert went in to get him. I covered him from a little way back. I heard a shot and a big commotion. Through the bush, I could see the cat take off. I fired twice, and then I went in. I missed the cat. Bert was stretched out on the ground. Bullet lodged in his spine. Progress report, Bert Cromwell. Nature of illness, paraplegia. Service required, rehabilitation instruction. On the first visit, the patient's attitude was negative. His morale was low. His suspicions aroused by the presence of a nurse. Under the direction of his personal physician, all efforts were expended toward making him more comfortable in the hope that this would induce a more cooperative attitude and rehabilitation work could be begun. By the third visit, the patient's reluctance to cooperate was somewhat overcome.
it was possible to begin teaching self-care techniques. He's learning to move around in bed and to dress himself. The bed sores on his heels and at the base of his spine have begun to heal. On the seventh visit, prescribed exercises were begun to build up the patient's shoulders and arms in preparation for the ambulatory techniques which will follow. The patient's attitude is now considerably improved. On the 10th visit, the patient's muscles were sufficiently strengthened to warrant beginning wheelchair activity. His anxieties concerning the chair were overcome, and the patient negotiated the transfer from bed to chair unassisted. In addition, the patient's vitality and interest in life now seem to be returning rapidly. Prior to attempting crutch walking, the patient is taught the care and use of orthopedic leg braces. The introduction of the braces causes some mental depression. However, this is a fairly common reaction, since it's the first time the patient has become acutely aware that his legs must be supported by heavy metal for the rest of his life. Today, Mr. Cromwell took four steps alone. We were both very pleased. The office said you called four times. I did. Come up here. I'll tell you all about it. All right. Monday, right after you left, I was sitting quietly. And suddenly, I felt something in this leg right here. Now, I know what your mind can do, so I just let it pass. Tuesday night, Stan had gone to bed, and I was lying reading, and my toes began to tingle. In the same leg, Burns. In the same leg. Listen, Mr. Cromwell. Now, Cromer. I tried to forget about it and put it out of my mind. I went to sleep. This morning, when I was getting into the chair, I stubbed my toe, and it hurt, Burns. It hurt. I felt it. Mr. Cromwell, every doctor you've seen, they all told you the same thing. I know whether I'm feeling something or not. They're my legs. Let me decide. Mr. Cromwell, your spinal cord is... I know, I know. If the spinal cord is smashed, it's hopeless. But maybe my spinal cord isn't smashed. Maybe my nerves are growing back. I want to see Dr. Stack. I want to see him right away. All right, I'll call him. About a week ago, you say. Just what did you feel? I stubbed the toe in my right foot and I felt it. Mm-hmm. Just let me turn you this way, Mr. Cromwell. I'd like to check for spasm. Tell me, what other sensation have you had? I bumped my right leg this morning and felt pain. Mm-hmm. Was it a dull throb or a, a sharp pain? Well, it's hard to say. It was just pain. Anything yet, Mr. Cromwell? No. Well, I'm sorry.
Mr. Cromwell. Goodbye. That isn't going to do any good, Mr. Cromwell. That's not the answer. Mind your own business. There's no need for that. There isn't? Take a look, Florence Nightingale. Been living with these dead weights for five years. Five years. And almost every one of them right here in this room. Try it sometime. I'll give you some ideas. Go on, get out of here. You'll pardon me, Mr. Cromwell. What you need right now is the truth. Will you get out? This isn't the movies, Mr. Cromwell. It's not just a couple of hours worth of film. You're not play acting. This is for keeps reality. Don't go chasing after something that's gone forever. I know what you're going through. I knew you'd have to go through it sooner or later. You lie here in bed. You see your lakes. You watch them for hours. They're right there just where they always were. But you can't believe that they won't move again. Your mind starts going to work and you start imagining things. You start inventing heat and cold and aches and pains. Your mind tries to tell you everything but the truth. And you try to believe it, but you really don't. Because down deep in your heart, you know the truth, the real truth. Your legs are gone. You can't walk. But you've got to accept it. You've got to. Please leave me alone. Having a fall like that could kill a man. That's me, lucky. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Not at all. You be sure and see your own doctor. Good night. Night. How are you, Mr. Cromwell? Good to see you again. Well, hello. Good to see you again. Mr. Cromwell, you're still living in the old house, are you? That's right. No change in your situation, huh? No, no change. How'd it happen, Bert? Just an accident. I was down in the living room and Bert wanted to talk to me. So he wheeled himself to the top of the stairs. Guess the brake on the chair didn't hold, and down he went. It's no good, Stan. Truth of the matter is, I was feeling sorry for myself, and I've been drinking. Drinking quite a bit. Happens for the best of us, Bert. Okay if I say it was a faulty brake? You must be.
be getting soft. You wouldn't have done that for me in the old days. Well, you've had your share of lumps. Another drunk story, more or less, ain't gonna make or break the paper. Thank you. Thank you. You're very considerate. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the story was really picked up all over the country. Just like the old days again. I guess people really miss the old Ambold. Yeah. Well, Henry, why don't you just send a couple of scripts over? Yeah, we'll try and work them in, even though it ain't the lead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, no. Sorry. I can't give you a yes or no right now. He's in with a bunch of reporters. Yeah. Just as soon as they break it up, I'll have them call you. Right, Henry. Goodbye. Henry Garland, the starlet's friend. Bert, we're back in business. He's got a part for you. Oh, what kind of a part? Murder on 58th Street. You play the part of a judge. You get to sit down through the whole thing. All he wants is to cash in on the publicity. Sure he does. But it's a chance for us, Bert. A chance to get started again. Young Bert Crumble playing the judge White's sensational. I'll never believe it. They might believe it. Would you believe it, Burns? Oh, I believed you in a dozen pictures, from Robin Hood to Geronimo. <laughs> you did, eh? Well, I'm only 40. Uh, plus. Why shouldn't I start again? They do it every day. In a wheelchair? Even in a wheelchair, you've got more going for you than Bennett. He's only got two moves. Hat on, hat off. You've got three. Hat on, hat off, sitting down. Four. No reason he can't act in crutches. Thank you, Burns. It's OK. You going to do it? What's Henry's number? Crestview 95479. Goodbye, Mr. Cromwell. Where are you going? Oh, it's 2 o'clock. Time for my diaper classes. You wouldn't want the fathers to stick pins in their babies, and they need me more than you do now. Well, we'll see you around, won't we? You won't be too busy to come by. Of course you'll see me around. Goodbye. Burns, wait a minute. Thank you, Burns. Mr. Garland, please. Stan Brown, for Bert Cromwell. Hey, Bert, I've got Garland's office back on the line. OK, let me have it. Now take this. Hello, Henry, this is Bert Cromwell. Oh, oh, he's on the other line. Uh, Bert Cromwell. Cromwell. C-R-O-M-W-E-L-L. -L. That's right. No, no, no. I'll hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very considerate. No, no. Okay, let me have it. Emotional and physical rehabilitation of a paraplegic requires knowledge, special skills, care, and infinite patience. These attributes a nurse promises to provide when she repeats the Florence Nightingale Pledge upon graduation. She takes an oath to loyally endeavor to aid the physician in his work and to devote herself to the well-being of those committed to her care. What you have seen tonight is an example of how that oath is carried out. 